Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Well, I think we can probably start. Um, so, hey, guys, uh, we are the hosts of Love Cast, the Boys Love podcast. And today we're going to talk about morality in Boys Love live action. I'm Pixie, and my part focuses on the adaption of fiction to live action. Um, when companies started adapting novels and mangas into live action, there was more thought to the excitement of it happening rather than discussions of, should this really be on a TV screen? I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, what some may call controversial plots and kinks in fiction, but there is a discussion to be had on whether these plots really are suited for the TV screen in the same way they were written, especially when the original work often is based on uh, written stories that are 10 plus years old. Um, Reading a novel, manga, or watching anime, there's no, doubt, there's no doubt that you are watching or reading fiction. It just, it's just words on a page or drawings. What you read in the comfort of your home is really none of anyone's business, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. But what we see with live action, fan service, and the consequent shipping culture is something else. Seeing two human beings, real people in a realistic world, feeds a fantasy that can for some be hard to differentiate from, uh, from reality. As an example, um, the boy who played Joffrey in Game of Thrones received so much hatred, not because he was a bad actor or a bad person, but because he played a character on a TV show so well that people couldn't distinguish him from his fictional character. Uh, mix that in with boys love, a genre portraying gay relationships where the girls watching often don't know anything about gay relationships beforehand. This is their first exposure to something many were told were wrong. And then they watch a series where, um, as an example, um, a man pays someone to rape an underage kid and he doesn't go to jail or suffer any consequences other than losing a friend. Um, a big brother's best friend rapes the 14-year-old little brother and the big brother is still friends with him. Uh, the little brother even looks up to the man who took advantage of him as a child. Uh, sexual harassment will lead to love if you only stick with it long enough. Following someone into the shower and groping them is fine as long as they fall in love with you later. Um, ice cubes used as lube. I don't need to tell you how wrong that one is. Uh, some of you might realize which show I'm talking about. It's a really popular one, like really popular. Uh, popular enough to get a sequel where even after seven years together, two people can't communicate and live a rather toxic life together. <laughs> the show is Tharn Type, and it's actually one of my favorite shows. I'm fully aware how ridiculous flawed the logic of the show is, but if you turn off your brain and just watch it for entertainment, it's a good show. I don't think we should focus on hate. Canceling Tharn Type or the author Mame uh, for what she wrote, uh, that, that doesn't really accomplish anything. It's just stopping the conversation that could be had. You can acknowledge that something could have been adapted better without bullying or hatred. Um, what I'm saying is that we should focus on praising those who take their time and consider how they adapt a novel or manga. They focus on good script writing, having consequences for actions, rewriting parts to reflect modern society. You can have angsty and dramatic shows with rape and sexual harassment, but you need to show some consequences for it. No more, haha, I sort of had sex with you when you were too drunk to stand, but you liked it, so it's okay. With comedic music, like own it for what it is. Um, recently, a good example of something uh, of someone thinking through what they were putting on the screen was the team behind Lovely Writer, the series. 
it's free on YouTube if you haven't watched it. Uh, not only did they very subtly and not so subtle sometimes <laughs> call out the very flawed BL industry in Thailand, uh, but they adapted the novel to reflect modern times. Uh, as an example, they changed a drunk, se a drunk sex scene into a you're drunk, I want to have sex with you, but we will cuddle instead. They made complex characters that aren't just black and white, and they called out the fan service, uh, fan service culture and showed how dangerous obsessive shipping can be for the real people behind the characters. They had consequences for actions and inclusivity. I think use your voice to praise those who make the effort, but don't use your energy on canceling those who don't live up to your own morals. Support the shows who do it right. Watch their official links. Share it with those you know. Make sure you show the companies behind these series that you want more of this, because that's the only way we get change. Money is how these shows are getting made. Publicity is key. Even hating on something is giving it publicity, which means more people will find it and subsequently people who wouldn't know about it will find it through your hate and maybe like it, giving it more support and breeding more of the same stories. Alexa. Okay, thank you for that, Pixie. So hi, everyone. I am Alexa. Um, I make up the second third of the Lovecast host trio. Um, for my section of the panel, I am going to be discussing uh, LGBTQ plus influence on boys love um, and what responsibility boys love productions and cast have when it comes to the consideration of the community in their work. Um, so as we all have probably noticed, uh, Boys Love has had a massive boom in popularity in recent years um, and in the live action sector, particularly in the last year and a half or so. Um, this can be contributed to massive shows like Together the Series and uh, Tarm Type, which Pixie was just talking about, uh, which infiltrated mainstream fandom spaces. Um, and that in combination with the global pandemic, which has a lot of people sitting at home almost all of the time. Uh, people needed something new to watch and yeah, it's fun, it's sexy. Um, it's a whole new genre of media for people to dive into. Um, so naturally it, it caught attention. Uh, it's like kind of crazy because when I first started watching uh, boys love dramas back in 2016, I would be on my Twitter like begging my mutual to watch some of my OG favorites like Sodas or Together With Me. And now people I have been in online spaces with for years will post about a BL or ask for Rex unexpectedly. Um, and it still surprises me every time. Like it's always just kind of wild when a niche interest that you are used to not having anyone to talk about suddenly has so many different people watching it. And naturally through the portrayal of male-male relationships, Boys Love has attracted a large queer audience and it's rising popularity. I mean, why do we think that is? I know from my personal experience as a bisexual woman who has been watching Asian, Asian dramas as a whole for over six years now, I kind of jumped at the chance to see same-sex relationships represented in the forms of media that I loved watching. And obviously I cannot speak for the larger community, but I think that people are just looking for new queer media and Boys Love catches their eyes and offers access to new same-sex series in movies that haven't been previously seen or promoted in mainstream media. Going back to what I said before, it kind of offers something shiny and new and a chance for a new and expanded representation. Now, of course, there is an argument that goes around that BL should not be seen as queer representation or that it is not a form of queer representation, but um, I'll touch on that more later. Like regardless of whether or not um, they should see it as representation, there are many people who do see boys love as a form of queer representation. They see themselves in these characters and in their experiences. And as the audience for boys love grows, the demand for better representation grows as well. 
Many fans are expecting more from these series and they want to see same-sex relationships portrayed in a better light. Things like less romanticization of sexual assault, like Pixie mentioned, more explicitly gay characters as opposed to the ever popular, I'm not gay, only like you trope, uh, less depictions of gay characters who are predatory and less stereotypical traits in characters that are openly gay. These are all things that we've seen across many different forms of boys love and boys love series and things that many viewers do not find any issue with, but there are queer people and non-queer people who do see issue in these things. In short, many people want to see new BLs that are more socially aware. Uh, so what happens when shows see these kind of conflicting expectations from different sides of the fandom? I think this is where we have kind of seen a blurring between the line of what is queer media and what is boys love media. Now, generally, I think that a lot of people can agree that a stereotypical BL does not fall under the umbrella definition of queer media. Um, I think queer media tends to be seen for more of the purpose of affecting social change and sharing stories of the queer experience, particularly the difficulty and dark aspects of it. Boys Love tends to be more fantastical in its storytelling, um, where the plots don't always follow what would happen in reality when it comes to the queer experience. However, of course, everyone has different interpretations of these terms, so of course they might understand the genres differently. Um, but for the, for the sake of the panel, assuming that we see queer media and BL as separate entities, uh, we are now beginning to see a fusion of these two types of media in some more recent dramas. They keep many of the fluffy and goofy romance aspects that we love to see in Boys Love while introducing some more socially conscious aspects when it comes to character ideology or plot lines. Um, one great example of the new fusion fusion between boys love and queer media would be in uh, Pinoy BLs. So the Fili Filipino boys love scene um, had a major boom last year after the success of Together the Series and the popularity of that show in their country. Um, and since then, they have been constantly putting out new content. Now, of course, many of these series are just pure, fantastical boys love that we know and love. Um, but a good member of popular Pinoy series have a common element across them, an aspect of social awareness and a clear intent to promote social change with the stories they are telling. So the first thing that sets a lot of Filipino BLs apart from um, how we're used to seeing the genre, um, especially within the last year, a lot of their series focus on finding queer love within the middle of the pandemic. Um, series like Game Boys, Boys Lockdown, Quarantine, Quarant things, they all highlighted the added struggle of a global crisis on top of an already marginalized queer dating pool. And on top of this, they've highlighted political aspects of the pandemic when it comes to resources and healthcare for the communities that have been most impacted and hurt in the past year and a half. Beyond this, the cast and creators of these series are also frequently discussing the importance of orienting themselves in their series within SOGI, um, that is sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Um, they express the desire to make sure their characters and plot lines show respect for these identities and try to portray a few of the multitude of life experiences that one can have in relation to uh, SOGI. Along with this, uh, many Pinoy BLs make an explicit effort to include members of cast, crew and production, et cetera, who are members of the LGBT plus community. And they also seek advice from people outside of the show who are members of the community as well. Now, this is not to say that productions from other countries or other companies don't include these things, um, but particularly in terms of casting, it seems that Pinoy BLs are openly embracing queer actors, while many other BLs still stray from this for fear of alienating the majority heterosexual female audience that they have. I know a lot of Boys Love fans, myself included, are always very surprised when I when they see the level of social awareness and, and advocacy that comes out of F Filipino BLs. 
simply because I'm not seeing that as something that has typically been focused on within the boys love genre of media. And for that reason, I think that Filipino BL is a great example of a way to potentially merge ideas of queer media with many of the traditional aspects of boys love that make it appealing to its audiences. That being said, I don't think that necessarily means that boys love as it exists now is wrong. Like I mentioned earlier, the discussion of whether boys love should be seen and treated as LGBTQ plus representation often comes up in BL fandom spaces. Uh, there are many fans of the genre, both queer and not queer, who love the genre as it exists. There are many people who prefer to keep BL separate from the heavy topics that are often found in queer media. Um, it's refreshing to see a same sex romance in an ideal world where they can love each other with little to no consequences. And I think it offers a reprieve from the often harsher reality of being queer. Uh, this has led to many discussions and, and sometimes conflict about what viewers should expect from boys love and whether boys love needs to reform itself to satisfy its growing audience. There are many people on both sides of the spectrum and I think both sides bring up valid points regarding boys love series and their place in media as well as the responsibility showrunners have to the audiences and the communities that they are portraying. So I think this is not to say that all boys love needs to transform and become something completely different than it is now. Um, but I do think that there is something to be said with companies and production teams being aware of their audience and what it desires. Um, as international exposure expands and the queer audience consuming the media expands, the desires of that audience are going to grow and change over time. And I think if these production teams want to keep making content for their audiences, then they'll need to consider all audiences that are now consuming BL. I don't think that there will ever be a perfect compromise that keeps every part of the boys love fandom happy. I mean, that's, that's the case with every fandom. No one's always going to be happy at all times, but I think there are examples of series that are slowly burnt blurring the lines like many of these Panoi BL series are, and that's a step in the right direction for um, the boys love industry to grow and change. So that's it from my section. If you give us just a second, we are going to do a quick screen share for um, Kayla's section. Give me just a moment here. Okay. Kayla, you're good to go. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Kayla, one third of the Lovecast podcast and the creator behind the YouTube channel Moon Consort. In this section of our presentation, I'll be talking a little about fan service and fan culture in BL. So let's get started. As with any form of media, things that were deemed acceptable in the past are no longer acceptable by modern standards. We learn and progress as our accessibility to knowledge expands. But what happens when the morality of this genre that we love and enjoy so much is brought into question? That's the overarching theme of our panel today but I would like to dive into a smaller but equally as important aspect of morality in BL, and that's fandom. Let me pose some of my own questions before we fully get into this topic. What happens when we find ourselves battling with fandom, with shippers whose behavior towards their favorite pairing is distasteful at the least and inappropriate at the most? Do we point the finger at each other or the people running the show? Now, fan service is an interesting facet of BL, specifically live action, because shipping two anime characters together is one thing, but when you ship real people together, you start venturing into another machine entirely. And I use the word machine because that's what it is this industry that pumps out endless content centering around young, conventionally attractive boys who may or may not be members of the LGBTQ community. It's a highly competitive space for rookie actors to break into and for veteran actors to maintain relevance. 
And with such a volatile market, we see actors being paired up, not just for the filming of a singular series, but as a brand that can rake in cash for years to come. The fantasy doesn't end when the cameras stop rolling. Offset, they're instructed to be touchy, to hug and kiss at sponsored events and fan meetings, to post clips and photos of them hanging out on social media. It's a 24 seven job in which their every word and action is scrutinized by fans who ship them together. These fans create their own fandoms that are dedicated to a specific pair of actors who have played as a couple in a BL series. Many have their own fandom names, colors, merchandise, anything you can think of. They're basically their own independent functioning country. So of course, people find comfort and friendship through these fandoms. I know I have. It's a beautiful thing when people from different parts of the world can bond over a similar interest. On paper, it looks good. However, there's always going to be fans who overstep their boundaries and become swept up in the illusion. We see this most notably in the Thai BL industry with pairings like Chris and Singto from Sodas and Off and Gun from Puppy Honey. But keep in mind, there are numerous pairings that have a very strong diehard fan base that supports their current projects and are expecting future ones. As a fan myself, I understand that want for your favorite acting pair to star in a new series together. But when does it get to be too much for the actors themselves? They undergo this constant pressure to satisfy people's fantasies and to, for all intents and purposes, go about life as a fake couple. This chain of supply and demand is a major downfall of fan service, and we've seen it backfire several times in the past. One instance I'd like to bring up is the popular BL couple Max and Tool and the news of Max dating a fellow actress named Mook. So this pairing has starred as a couple in two separate projects, but they're best known for their series Together With Me. Since it's airing in 2017, they've grown a sizable fandom of dedicated shippers, which is by no means a bad thing. However, things took a turn earlier this year when Mook posted a photo of her and Max together, then proceeded to delete it. This stirred up dating rumors and led to Max revealing that they'd been dating for a whole year. As you can imagine, many fans of Max Tool attacked Mook for breaking up their pairing and thus breaking this fantasy that Max and Tool could be gay and in a relationship with each other. This was not the first time an actor from a BL pairing was revealed to have a girlfriend and it certainly won't be the last. A similar example can be seen with the BL couple Bright and Wynn from the series Together. Last year, Bright's girlfriend came under fire for some socio-political posts she retweeted about Taiwan and China, along with some liked tweets that fans interpreted as shade towards Wynn. Um, many fans were upset and demanded that Bright break up with her. The two had actually been dating before the series even aired. But the main reason why I, um, the main reasons for this outrage centered around the girlfriend's political beliefs. And as we saw with Max Tool, this shattering of the Bright Wind pairing. I bring this up because I think it effectively shows how fans will go after people who are in association with their favorite actor if they deem that person to be ruining said actor's reputation. It's the crossing of a line that's highly debated, but can seriously distract the fandom from the series itself. Through these instances with Max Tool and Brightwin, we see how possessive fans can be over the actors they follow. There's this sense of ownership that is unfortunately encouraged by the companies who produce these BL series. You've heard the phrase sex sells and it does. The more fan service a pairing engages in, the more profit they can make off their loyal fan base. And fan service comes in all shapes and sizes. It's selling skincare products together in an Instagram ad. It's eating a brand name ramen together in a Facebook live stream. As long as the two of them are performing as a team, they can promote things just by being in the same vicinity as one another. Capitalism does breed innovation after all. 
the average fan is conscious of the fact that this type of fan service isn't grounded in reality. But when companies push these pairings to be more and more provocative, the line starts to blur. And for an impressionable audience, this can severely impact the way they interact with their favorite actors. This target demographic of young teens and women may start to think it's okay for them to ask invasive questions about an actor's sexuality or intimate details about their love life. It's truly a never ending cycle of, this is what the fans want, this is what we're giving them, and if it works out, let's repeat the formula. When it comes to this topic, we could travel down the rabbit hole, but to summarize, Fan service between an acting pair is a huge marketing tactic that companies take advantage of. A lot of it is harmless, but enough of it is harmful that it warrants this type of discussion. Another aspect of fan culture I'd like to bring up is the sexualization of underage actors in BL. This is another phenomenon that happens rather frequently with actors such as Neo and Fu Win from Cuz You're My Boy who were 15 and 17 during filming. And today's example, Perth from Love by Chance. So Perth is a Thai actor who at 17 was cast as a university student in a BL series. For context, he was directed to act out multiple bed scenes with his co-star Saint, who was 19 at the time. During these scenes, sexually suggestive words and actions are both alluded to and actively shown. It's not the most graphic depiction from a technical standpoint, but it does point to the main question behind our panel. What is considered morally acceptable in BL? And my personal question, is it morally acceptable for a director to put an underage kid in front of a camera and say to them, be seductive? entice the viewer, sell us sex. It's a sensitive topic and it becomes even more complex when you factor in the fandom's response. Typically, you'll see two things happen. One group of fans busting out their legal jargon about age of consent and the other group berating the first for thinking that legality is a guide for morality. But what we see less is either party holding the production team itself accountable for putting the underage actors in this position. Complacency in the sexualization of minors is something that we as a fandom should never condone. But I will say there's something far more sinister about the idea of grown adults in the BL industry signing off on erotic scenes involving kids. And, and on some other occasion, we can get into the abuse of power that's rampant in the entertainment field. But for now, I highlight this example with Perth to show how different fans react to controversies such as this one. Something else that oftentimes, something else to consider is that oftentimes there doesn't have to be sexually explicit material in a series for fans to sexualize minors. It will happen either way. This is where we get into fandom accountability. And so let's start with an example. More recently, we saw a child actor from the BL series, Lovely Writer, be sexualized by fans to the extent where his parents had to step in and address the situation. In this case, the actor was not placed in a sexual situation by the production team. He simply starred in a handful of flashback scenes from the character's childhood. And yet some fans still flooded his Instagram with comments like, he's so hot and other things that I don't feel comfortable reading. Mind you, this is a prepubescent kid we're talking about who's so young that his parents run his social media accounts for him. With this situation, there's an obvious wrong on the fandom's part. You'd be daring to think otherwise. So when it's not as black and white, who do we blame? The production team who's encouraging the public to view these kids in a sexual light or the fans who are boldly engaging in predatory behavior? Depending on the unique circumstances, the fault could very well lie with both parties. If there's one thing we can agree on, it's that this discussion about fan service and fan culture is extremely complicated. That being said, I want to end off my section of the presentation by 
reminding those of you who are watching or listening to just be conscious of the media you're consuming and to respect the privacy of the actors and actresses who make the live action BL fandom as wonderful and entertaining as it has the potential to be. I know that many of us use BL as an escape from reality, but please don't allow yourself to be overtaken by fantasy. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you, guys. You have, we are open for questions if anyone has any. How can international audiences hold themselves and production team accountable versus domestic audiences? Hmm. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know it's hard because obviously international fans are still viewed as outsiders in the fandom to a large degree. Um, but I think as, as BL gets more popular, um, our voices are being listened to. Um, I think it's kind of um, like what both Pixie and Kayla touched on Um a lot of times when these issues come up, I think, um, and there's conflict or issue within a boy's love, I think people's first instinct is to go for the actor portraying the character or um, involved in a particularly controversial scene. Um, but I think as Kayla talked on, and we also had an episode with this, um, with Ari, who was also in a presentation here at Fujukan, um, I think it's more important to consider the production companies and start holding these companies accountable. Mm -hmm. I think that they know that international boys love fans are watching their shows now or else they wouldn't be so adamant about providing English subtitles and, and making their shows available to um, international audiences. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of these shows are looking for input to international fans as well as their production companies. Um, so I think being aware of who is behind a production that you're interested in or a production that has potentially been involved in some controversy and mm -hmm. um, holding them accountable um, and kind of going to their team as opposed to coming for the actor who a lot of the times does, does not have as much control as we want to believe they do. Um, whether it be mm -hmm. writing emails, I know a lot of the times when things happen, mm -hmm. fans will start email campaigns um, and send them to the company's marketing teams or things like that. Or even as simple as tweets, a lot of people do monitor their international um, responses on their Twitter. So I think, you know, just letting the companies and the productions behind these shows know that you're not okay with something that is happening or has happened mm -hmm. um, is more important in my personal opinion on um, as opposed to going after the actor themselves. That being said, I think there are situations where actors do need to be held accountable, of course. Um, but I think everyone and, you know, has their own judgment on that and, and can know when it's like actor versus the company. Hmm. I think the most easiest way to sort of um, don't not support these companies making these uh, problematic um, or doing these problematic stuff is just don't watch the stuff. Mm. Uh, don't give them the publicity. Don't even talk about them on social media because that's publicity. So like you have the... Uh, a company um, that uh, for a couple of years ago uh, put out like a notice that they uh, needed actors, but they didn't want gay actors for a BL. Mm. And like stuff, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that is crazy. And, and we need to be aware of it. And uh, we need to research the companies and just don't support them in anything. And like I said, don't hate on them because it's not it's not working <laughs> just ignore is the best way really and then uh, send those emails because that's like it's not public right so you're not like um, drawing more attention to them to people who possibly might support the what they are doing mm. um, uh, I, I, said I uh, what shows and companies might be considered problematic um I think mm -hmm. that is different for everyone. Yeah. Um, someone answered history for, yeah. um, I think everyone has different ideas of what they consider problematic. Mm -hmm. um, I know one 
pretty clear example of a company within the boys love fandom Mm -hmm. um and kayla herself has done videos on her youtube channel about them um and this also happens to be the company that pixie was talking about um not wanting to cast gay characters um if you guys have watched the boys love two moons or two moons two um that company motive village (laughs) has been continuously steeped in different forms of controversy throughout both of the different series that they put out um the first one they had issues with like pixie said um not wanting to you know purposely excluding gay um actors in their casting calls Mm -hmm. um they also had issues with the cast they did choose and ousting them from the sequel to the series without mm-hmm. um, uh, appropriately letting the cast know that they wouldn't be involved in the second season of the series. And then yeah. the cast they did involve with the second season of the series um, was also involved with in controversies behind the scene, yeah. um, even as far as going um, higher up powers in the in the company um abusing their power and trying to uh obtain sexual types of relationships from one of the actors now of course this is um all alleged but um there has been enough discussion and enough evidence that most fans do believe that these are things that actually happen to that actor and Mm -hmm. all of the actors involved in that production have since left the company um so i think it's pretty clear that when it comes to Motive Village, that's one very clear example of a company that um, should be avoided and has clearly been doing very problematic things with their actors for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I had a problem with History 4. Um, most like, okay, the whole step, uh, the brother thing is a problem. But uh, what uh, the biggest problem there was that they uh, labeled the show for uh, 15 and up. And there were no warnings for really explicit scenes and um, very um, odd dialogue sometimes. Like uh, one of the characters uh, told um, the guy who was touching him in the bathroom that uh, if I was a woman, that would be sexual harassment. And I was just, that's so harmful to say, like, because you're a man, and another man is touching you inappropriately, it's not sexual harassment. Mm. What even is that? Like, mm. so th- there's, yeah. <laughs> but like, I, I think there's a lot of um, BLs out there right now that have questionable um, stuff happening <laughs> in them. So that's why I like, think it's more important to focus on the ones that actually take the time to make uh uh, what you can call a morally good uh, show rather than focusing on the bad ones. Mm. Like uh, give some credit to lovely writer and um, show like even until we meet again, which is a really angsty show, but it doesn't have like a big problematic um, stuff in it. Agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? And I, I really want to say, too, that it, we are not calling um, fiction like uh, mm. what you read and uh, manga and anime. It's not in the same category because you're uh, you have fictional drawn or um, written characters versus real people portraying mm. characters. So I think there's a really big difference there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But yeah, you guys should check out some of the Thai BLs and stuff because like even though like we're studying <laughs> talking about the problematic <laughs> stuff, there's a lot of good <laughs> stuff out there. <laughs> I think that like just do your research on it yeah. and, and you'll f- find out. Don't use my drama list. That is not a good place to find your information. <laughs> <laughs> but like enter communities like we have a bl um a discord server um that's really good that we get information from uh, it's actually where we met me and alexa mm-hmm. so it's like a good place to um hear it directly from other people also yes the filipino boys love series mm-hmm. they are like so good like if mm-hmm. you haven't like 
taken a step into checking out Filipino boys loves yet, I would highly recommend it. Um, some great ones uh, like in the movies or Gaia Saab Pelicula, mm. Game Boys, Boys Lockdown. Um, those are just a few of the ones that I have personally really enjoyed. I know Kayla has to promote her channel again, recently done a video on her favorite Pinoy VLs. Um, so if you want to check out her YouTube channel and look at some of those, um, she has a lot of great opinions on them as well. So I would definitely recommend uh, jumping into the Pinoy VL scene because I have just been like of the ones I've seen repeatedly blown away by how yeah. like socially aware and socially forward they are. And it's really nice to see. Yeah. And if you're yeah. interested in like gossipy stuff, Kayla has a lot of videos. <laughs> the drama the tea. <laughs> Not the gossip. I will say also, as with like any industry of BL, there are going to be dramas even in Filipino BL yeah. that are still problematic and yeah. have some themes that uh, I guess are just not fleshed out as well. So I would say still even do the research with Filipino BLs. Most of them are very good, but uh, mm -hmm. there are some that <laughs> it's just a little more questionable, um, yeah. the ethics behind them. Ren said, Pino BL is kind of the wild west. There are some really awful ones <laughs> yeah. and some really wonderful ones. Exactly. That pretty much sums it up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's been some drama with the Pinoy BLs too. Like, um, uh, the my, my Day was... That's the name, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, with the actors there and not getting paid. And yeah, it was a wild ride. <laughs> yeah, there will be there will be controversy everywhere, but um, like mm, we we're just saying, it's all about the research you do. And um, you know, everyone has their different moral threshold. So I think just do research for yourself and know what you're comfortable with and go from there. Yeah. Tony LaBruscia was recently got got a law lawsuit because he yeah. uh, allegedly allegedly uh, sexually harassed a girl. So that's something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, the Jollibee rumor thing, I am not too educated on it, but I think it had something to do with the Jollibee using an actor who is homophobic to promote pride stuff. <laughs> oh, that's a choice. Yeah. Am yeah, I, that's, that's yeah, 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 yeah. I heard about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, rainbow capitalism is a whole, <laughs> a whole yeah. that we could do a whole <laughs> pin on that alone and yeah. the idea of trying to sell being gay and pride and how these companies behind the doors don't actually care about the LGBTQ community, which mm. the same can be said for some boys love production teams as well. I mean, a lot of them do see it as just a way to make money on yeah. a genre that is trending, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's a, I could, we could do a whole panel on that. Yeah, alone, but you, can, like. you can like <laughs> argue that um, by them, they are after the money, but it is giving more um, growth to the genre. Mm. And that's a positive thing. Like it's getting in front of more people. Uh, but by the end of the day, these companies, they are there for the money. Even if they're LGBTQ plus positive or not, they're there for the money. They need to earn money. So I, I think like the, the um, it's more important to focus on are they respectful or not? Yeah. And and, mm -hmm. and take it from there because it, it will always be about the money, which is like the easiest way to affect a company is taking away the money. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Don't watch things. Just don't interact. Don't buy the merch if they're doing problematic stuff and they will change because it's affecting their wallet. Yeah, I think sometimes people also um, have different definitions of what is considered problematic. Mm. And I feel like in those cases, you should just, I don't know, listen to other people and other perspectives, because maybe they are seeing it in a different way than you and they'll have their reasons for that too. Uh, what's the best place <laughs> to find out information besides Discord? Um, like there's a community on Reddit um usually mm -hmm. you can get a lot of a lot of um good information there and um yeah i i like listen to like um people on youtube or like we 
commentators on YouTube. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Kayla's channel has videos about it when she gets around to it. (laughs) (laughs) Let me put my um, YouTube channel in the chat so you know how to spell it. (laughs) I think for, um, I mean, as much of a cesspool as it can be, Twitter is um there is always a well I'm sorry I just knocked my mic I hope you guys didn't hear that um but there is always a lot of active discussion going on around um different shows and on Twitter um you do have to weed through a lot of um mess sometimes Mm -hmm. but I know I find a lot of information about um voice of updates like there are specific uh Twitter accounts that Mm. like primarily just update on what's going on and um, different controversies that happen. Like if you watch um, Ty BL, then you probably know like Lazy Subber and JBL. Um, They're two very large um, Thai BL fans who are from Thai, but also speak English, um, Mm -hmm. who not only do show commentary, but also um, talk about issues that are going on within shows and and controversies that come up with Thai fans as well as um, um, international fans. So Mm -hmm. uh, they are very um, informative accounts and I like to follow them for a lot of information. Um, I can put their apps down in the chat as well. So yeah, yeah, um, at Lazy Subber and at JBL. And I know they're both, I think, also on facebook if people prefer facebook in this day and age still (laughs) the idea may be to present that men get sexual harassment but because they are men no one talks about it and that don't happen to them the idea of sexual harassment only happens Mm -hmm. to women what do you think about that yeah like i said that's a common thing and i think like it's um there's a change happening, but I think like shows like History 4 really put that on the back burn again. Mm-hmm. I'm a little, uh, I'm a little surprised that a show could be so thoughtless uh, about what they put into it in like this day and age. Uh, like the Thai BL shows aren't even as um, thoughtless about stuff like that. But I do think like there's a change happening and, and there's uh, more um, uh, spotlight on that men can also be sexually harassed by women. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. this is a good comment. There's this idea that men should want sex want always, no matter whether it's consensual or not. Um, and that is a very large problem about masculinity and sexuality in the larger society um but i do Mm. think um that translates and translates into uh boys love as well um this idea that as long as you are getting some then you should be happy about it which is um very disgusting at its core um and unfortunately a lot of shows do still um showcase that and and make comedy out of sexual assault because they think that um as long as it's sex it's a good thing and and that's not the case um Mm -hmm. but like pixie said um i think it's something that is going to take a while to change because Mm -hmm. toxic masculinity is still so prevalent in the society Mm -hmm. um but there are shows that highlight on it and um hopefully as we advocate for better representation and better Mm -hmm. use of sexuality and boys love we can hopefully see that start to change but I think it will be still it's very much still an uphill battle unfortunately Mm. I think like a lovely writer did a great job at addressing Mm. that there was a lot of um, focus on consent yes without making it uh, boring is that the right way to say it like I, I get like I like aggressive um, shows. I like like the whole um, aggressive trope, <laughs> but um, there's a difference between being aggressive and sexual harassing someone, right? Mm. So so you need to find a balance there sometimes. And lovely writer really did a good job. So any question in the last ten minutes? Yeah. Um nubs have had red flags all over I have seen um a lot of discussion about that um and I know even uh they recently started 
making an English subtitle of the uh, book translation available. Um, and apparently in the book, um, he's even worse. So from mm-hmm. what I've seen, um, he was toned down a lot for the series, um, which I don't know what that says about the novel. I have chosen not to read it as much as I did enjoy the series. Um, but I have seen a lot of discussion about um, Dub Zip's character and how aggressive he was towards Jean. Um, it's very, I, I totally agree because there are some times when like, I really appreciated how Nubs have acted when him and Jean were together and they wanted to come out and him making sure um, Jean was comfortable there. Uh, but I do agree that there are points where um, his portrayal or pursuing of Jean was um, very much on the aggressive side. And I can mm-hmm. see very much understand why people did not appreciate his character for that. Yeah. Yeah, like we said, it's not it's not perfect, and it's not gonna get perfect anytime yeah. soon. But there's effort, right? There's effort into trying to understand and um, showcasing the problems, and I'm all for that. Um, like, I don't want to see the BL genre go away, right? You just you want change. Um, Korean BL also is less non-con, dub con. Yes, but uh, Korean BL also strays on the side of being almost too careful because they don't, they won't, they are not, um, they're not homophobic country, but um, in, in, in Korea, um, it's more seen like um, gays don't exist is their attitude to things. So it's getting better but it's still it's still straying on the side of like Chinese um censorship yeah we're very much still I mean the fact that we have gotten Korean BL dramas in the past like what has it been like a year year and a half Mm -hmm. now um that is a huge step even if they're just very short web dramas um because like Pixie said before um most shows that did entertain anything queer um it was either a side character or like a very much indie under the radar film Mm -hmm. um so I think um Korea is stepping into the market and the web dramas that they have done um are pretty good um I don't know if we'll ever see like a full length well I'm sure we'll see one but I think it'll still be a while before we see like a full length on mainstream television, Korean BL, if ever. Um, But I do think the fact that we have seen explicit LGBT shows and BL shows coming out of Korea in the past year is a huge step for them. Yeah. Yeah, and I I can recommend make one recommendation. If you're going to watch Korean BLs, go uh, search for the movie versions because um, they put in extra scenes in the movie versions and it gives a whole different narrative to the story so i wouldn't i wouldn't watch the tv show just go straight to the movie it's the same thing they just uh, put it into a movie right they just and put in extra scenes mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and there's sometimes some extra content some of them are on netflix from what i know like i but yeah you are right that a lot of them um you'll need paid vicky account for that information yeah. which kind of sucks some of them but... are coming to uh, netflix yes so, like mm-hmm. wish you uh the korean uh BL. you can find it on um, netflix so that's yeah. awesome uh game boys is also on netflix now yes so... kayla is our number one game yeah. <laughs> advocate here <laughs> And I know that they added a lot of um, new content because when they were first starting off, the episodes were like 10 minutes long, but now they're about like the length of a regular episode of a show, like 20 or 30 minutes. Nice. Mm. Yeah, so I don't know if yeah. we have like five minutes left if anyone has any last minute questions, but overall thank you guys for tuning in because yeah. this is our first time ever doing anything like this and um we usually like all of our podcasts are pre-recorded so we're used to being able to like edit out mistakes <laughs> and all that stuff so like thank you for um making this nice and engaging with us because we were also really worried that no one would show up <laughs> or have any questions so yeah this, was, this went a lot better than I think we were expecting yeah 
right then I guess that wraps it up yeah <laughs> thank you guys so much for joining us this was a thank lot you. of fun we had so much fun <laughs>